So uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Professor Jeff McMahon, right, who is our guest speaker today. Jeff is currently a professor uh, of philosophy at Rutgers University, and he's also a visiting research collaborator, collabor collaborator at the University Center for Human Values at Princeton University. Jeff has published, I believe it's eight books now. Among these include, <laughs> well, it's eight because there's a couple coming, you know, and so I'm not sure if they're out just yet or not. So uh, the titles include British Nuclear Weapons, For and Against, uh, Reagan in the World, Imperial Policy in the New Cold War, The Morality of Nationalism, co-edited with Robert McKim, The Ethics of Killing, Problems at the Margins of Life, Killing in War, which is almost out. I think it'll be out in a month, actually, published. Uh, and The Values of Lives. He has two more books forthcoming with Oxford University Press, which uh, I'm particularly looking forward to. Uh, the first is titled The Morality and Law of War, which has already won the American Philosophical Association's biennial Frank Champion Sharp Memorial Prize for the best unpublished essay or monograph on the philosophy of war and peace. The second is titled The Ethics of Killing, Self-Defense, War, and Punishment. Uh, for work on this forthcoming book, I believe Jeff, Jeff has just uh, recently been, been awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship. In addition to these books, Jeff has published over, well, nearly 80 articles with several, several forthcoming. I'll just give you a, a few of those more recent articles so you can get an idea of his work. Um, the Ethics of Killing and War, Unjust War in Iraq, the Morality of War and the Law of War, Humanitarian Intervention, Consent and Proportionality, Torture in Principle and in Practice, Torture and Collective Shame, Just Cause for War, The Ethics of Military Occupation, uh, Child Soldiers, The Ethical Perspective, Individual Responsibility and the Law of Use Ad Bellum, and Eating Animals the Nice Way. <laughs> On a personal note, I thought I might just add that I've always admired Jeff's ability to take what uh, might be considered the common uh, view or the, accept, the widely accepted view and turn it on its head, right? Uh, sometimes when I read philosophy or philosophical positions, I think about what has gone before, and I think, okay, that view is a little bit like this view, but just a little bit different. And this view, this author, this philosopher is asking me to accept a different view that has Maybe just a little bit take. A little bit different of a take, but I can maybe, maybe agree with it a little bit. Sometimes when I read Jeff's work, I feel like I'm slowly being turned upside down. And when I get there, I think, hey, this just might be right, right? <laughs> he, you know, he might, this, could, this might actually be right. And then, and then I think of uh, a phrase by David Byrne in The Talking Heads, how did I get here? Right? <laughs> how did I get here? And how, why am I buying into this view? Um, I think uh, Jeff's work is interesting and insightful, right? And it's, his current work pertaining to war and just war theory is clearly relevant and important. I want to especially thank the, the Rahatan Center uh, and the Political Science Department and the Philosophy Department uh, in helping Lorraine Besser Jones, myself, bring Jeff to campus. Uh, so, with that, I'll turn it over to him today. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. That's a very, very nice introduction. I was thinking uh, towards the end, you poor guy, it's not, it's not right. And here you are <laughs> thinking that it's right. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is proportionality. This is an idea that gets some discussion in law, in the law of self-defense, in traditional just war theory, and in contemporary discussions about the morality of war. Uh, recently, most notoriously, in the case of the Israeli invasion of Gaza, which was widely condemned on the ground that it was disproportionate. <clears throat> so what I'm going to try to do today is to help us understand the complexity in this notion of proportionality. It's not simple. People talk about it in the press as if this were some relatively simple, straightforward idea about which it's easy to make 
assertions that can clearly be true or false. And what I want to suggest is that there are many, many dimensions to proportionality that are not understood and entirely ignored in the tradition of thought about war called the just war tradition <clears throat> and are largely ignored in the legal literature on self-defense and in the legal literature on war, the materials in the law of war and the international humanitarian law. So let me start by pointing out that in just war theory, there are thought to be two proportionality restrictions, one governing resort to war and another governing individual acts of war. They are concerned with the consequences of going to war and with the consequences of particular acts of war. The idea is that if the bad consequences are in some way excessive in relation to the aim, the war or the act will be disproportionate. Interestingly, to the best of my knowledge in the law of war, there is no proportionality restriction on the resort to war, on wars as a whole. That's an idea that you find in just war theory. If it exists in international law, I don't know where it is. Certainly in international law, there is a proportionality requirement governing individual acts of war, and I'll talk with you a little bit about that today. You do find that in the Geneva Conventions Protocol 1, um, and I'll tell you what that says in a little while. My concern in this talk will be with proportionality as a moral restriction. Though, of course, what I am going to say is relevant to what the law ought to say about proportionality. It doesn't mean that they should be the same thing, but clearly uh, what the law says about proportionality ought to be parasitic on what is true morally about proportionality. <clears throat> How long do you want me to go for? Okay, and did we start kind of late? Yeah. At 5.50, is that when the whole thing ends? You don't want me to talk till then. No, wait. Okay, I'll, I'm getting really confused now. You mean maybe 5.20? 5, 5, yeah, 5.20. All right, we're just you know, wanting to know how long we have to hold you captive here. Um, Okay, now, it's usually assumed uh, that in war, there's one proportionality requirement for each dimension of war, the resort to war and uh, individual acts of war. And it's widely assumed that this proportionality restriction is concerned with side effect harms inflicted on innocent people, innocent bystanders. It's generally assumed that there really is no proportionality constraint on the harms that one inflicts on enemy combatants in war. In individual self-defense, it's also assumed widely that there's really only one proportionality restriction. But there, the proportionality restriction is assumed to be concerned with the harms that one inflicts on the attacker. So that's curious. It's one kind of proportionality restriction in war, a different kind in self-defense. And I think it's fairly easy to see why people have thought this. It is that in war, it's assumed that all enemy combatants are liable to be killed at any time, anywhere, while war is in progress. They are legitimate targets no matter what they're doing, whether they're sleeping or in the bath or whatever. If you can kill an enemy combatant at any time, anywhere, it's hard to see how there could be any proportionality restriction on the harms that one intentionally inflicts on those enemy combatants. What could be worse than killing them? And there doesn't seem to be any particular restriction on the number of enemy combatants that it's considered permissible to kill in war. So that would be the explanation why there's no discussion about the, the proportion, proportionality and the harms that one inflicts on one's attackers in war. Similarly, in individual self-defense, acts of individual self-defense don't usually have extensive harmful side effects on innocent bystanders. 
So you can see why there wouldn't be much concern with, with harms to innocent people in the case of individual self-defense. But I think that for the sake of completeness, we need to recognize that in both war and self-defense, there has to be proportionality in all of the harms that one inflicts, but that not all harms count in the same way. So I think it's just for starters. I think that there are two proportionality restrictions on the resort to war, one on what one does to enemy combatants and what one will do in, uh, as a side effect to innocent bystanders. Similarly, there are two uh, restrictions of those sorts that apply in the case of individual acts of war during war. And I think the same thing is true in individual self-defense. And I want to illustrate that by uh, briefly discussing uh, a well-known case of individual self-defense. <clears throat> Some of you are old enough to remember this. The case I have in mind is the case of Bernard Goetz. Uh, you'll remember the guy who, in I think the late 70s, early 80s, I think early 80s actually, um, was menaced by four panhandlers on the New York subway and shot all four of them. He went to trial for this. Um, and the issue that was raised by the trial of Bernard Goetz was, was, the, was his use of force and violence in this situation disproportionate self-defense? And the question there primarily was, was the harm that he inflicted on these four men excessive in relation to the threat that they posed to him? Now, he was acquitted, but it seems perfectly clear uh, that, in fact, the violence that he used in response to this threat was disproportionate. I'm going to call this judgment of proportionality a judgment of narrow proportionality. It's a judgment about proportionality and the harm to which attackers may be liable. So it's pretty clear that these people, in menacing him, were liable to be harmed in some way or other. He had some rights of defense against them, but shooting them seemed clearly excessive. Some of them were injured uh, for, for life, paralyzed and brain damaged and that kind of thing. All they were asking of him was $5, though they acted in a menacing way. Now, well, let, me, let me just mention, before I give you the second concept of proportionality here, let me mention one thing that a complication about proportionality that I'm not really going to go into here, though it may well come up in some of the uh, comments during the discussion. This was a, a, an important question in Getz's trial, and that is whether proportionality is concerned with the objective threat that a person faces, the, you know, the threat as it really is, or whether proportionality is concerned with the person's beliefs about the threat that he faced. That was one of the crucial issues in the Getz trial. He really believed himself to be under serious threat. In fact, he doesn't seem to have been. There is another possibility, too, and uh, that is that you could assess proportionality relative to a person's reasonable beliefs about a threat that he faces, even if those beliefs, while reasonable, are nonetheless false. So there is a real issue in the law there about whether we should have a subjective standard for the assessment of proportionality or an objective standard. And that, that issue is going to r run throughout all other questions about proportionality. I'm not going to resolve that or try to resolve that because I actually think that all forms, all, both forms of subjective proportionality and objective proportionality are relevant. It depends on what our particular concerns are, which one we think is, is important. But I don't think we can dismiss any of them. Okay, notice that although the principal issue in the Getz trial had to do with whether the harm that he inflicted on his, the people who were threatening him was disproportionate in relation to the threat that they posed to him, the other issue of proportionality arose as well because he was firing a gun uh, within the uh, confined space of a subway car where there were other innocent passengers who had no means of egress from the carriage. So these people were in this small enclosed space in which he was firing bullets, and they could easily have been hurt. 
And I also think, this is just my own view, uh, that the risks that he imposed on those innocent people as a side effect were disproportionate in relation to the threat that he faced. So I call that judgment a judgment of wide proportionality. That's concerned with harms or risks imposed on innocent people, innocent bystanders. <clears throat> now, like I said earlier, the issue of narrow proportionality, what you do to an attacker, was the primary focus in the Getz case. It's the primary focus in almost all instances of individual self-defense. Is often thought not to arise in the case of war. I think that's a mistake. I think that there clearly can be instances of uh, disproportionate use of force against enemy combatants. I also think it's clear that there can be wars that are disproportionate in the effects that they would have on the aggressor. Um, let me give you a fanciful example. Here's a, just, here's a joke example. Suppose um, uh, we have one acre of ground on the Canadian border that we're using as a garbage dump. But for the Canadians, it's a sacred site. You know, it's important for their religious practices or something like that. And we refuse to yield it up to them. We say, no, no, that's our territory. So they send the Mounties or whoever they are, you know, the Canadian forces, and they come and they occupy. They conquer and occupy this one acre of garbage dump. And they set up their forces in there, and they say, you know, we're annexing this piece of your territory. Now, suppose we could easily just drop a bomb in there and kill them all and end the war that way. Um, I think the objection to that would be that this was disproportionate. That we wouldn't be harming any innocent bystanders. We'd be attacking only military personnel. I still think that would be disproportionate in relation to the importance of our aim. Suppose we have a just aim there. It's not like the Falklands War or something like that. We have this little acre of territory and it's ours and we want it and we don't, we don't feel like we need to give it up to anybody. But it, it's disproportionate to kill a lot of people for a goal like that. So while I agree narrow proportionality in individual acts of war, which is concerned with the harms we inflict on enemy combatants. While I think that the, that is uh, not a very important issue, it's still not, it still is an issue, which most people don't recognize. Let me turn now to another question. What effects, good and bad, count in the proportionality calculation that we might make about a war? It seems pretty clear that not all good effects count in favor of a war. Not all good effects seem to have a justifying role in war. Suppose we're thinking of going to war and we're weighing up the costs and the benefits or we're, and, and somebody says, well, it's going to have all these bad effects. What, what, would, what would the good effects be? And I said, well, you know, it'd be really good for business for the morticians in the war zone. They're going to get a lot, of, a lot of commerce out of this war. Now, nobody would think that that would be a good effect of going to war. Lots of business for undertakers uh, that should count in the proportionality calculation. Let me say something about that, though. I actually think that the goods that count in what I'm calling the narrow proportionality requirement are more restricted than those that count in what I'm calling the wide proportionality calculation. Most of you are probably familiar with the idea that for a war to be just or justified, there has to be a just cause. That is, there has to be some wrong that has been done or is being done that the war would somehow prevent or rectify. My view is that what people are liable to in war is determined by their responsibility for the wrong, the prevention or correction of which provides the just cause for war. What that means, I think, is that when you're thinking about uh, narrow proportionality, what it might be excessive to do uh, to, the, to, to the adversary in war, the only good effects that count are those that are involved in the just cause, in the achievement of the just cause. 
the fact that going to war would be good for your economy or whatever, you can't weigh those goods in against the harms that you were going to cause in the war. Um, you can see this if you think about a parallel issue in individual self-defense. Again, I'm going to move back and forth between individual self-defense and war. Suppose there's a pickpocket um, and he's, he's taken my wallet and it's got $20 in it and the only way I can uh, stop him get from getting away with my wallet is to kill him. That seems to me disproportionate. In, you know, I just have to let him go. He gets away with my $20 because the force that I would use against him, even though he's a wrongdoer, is excessive in relation to the harm that he's doing to me. But somebody might say, well, no, look, if you shoot the, the, the fleeing pickpocket, it will have these further good effects. You can use his organs for transplantation and save people's lives. So you, the war, the, your action becomes proportionate. That seems to me to be a mistake. The only harms to which this person is morally liable are those for which he's responsible. So we can't use killing the pickpocket as a means of saving other people's lives because he's not liable to be harmed for that purpose. He's liable to be harmed only for the rectification of the wrong, the prevention or rectification of the wrong for which he's responsible, namely picking my pocket and trying to take my money. Now, I think, though, that when we get to the wide proportionality restriction, that is thinking about proportionality in relation to the harms that war would cause to innocent people, then I think all bad effects count and all good effects count. So, you know, go back to my joking example about war increasing business for undertakers. Uh, Suppose somebody says to me, look, in this war, there's going to have this very bad effect. It's going to have this terrible effect on the economy, on certain, certain people are going to be thrown out of their jobs in this country if we have this war. Well, then it, it doesn't seem to me to be entirely ludicrous to say, well, look, it's going to, it's going to increase employment for doctors and emergency room people and morticians and others so that in the end, the effects on the economy overall are going to balance out. It doesn't seem to me to be an absurd thing to say. That's just one example. There could be more serious or realistic examples than that. But notice that when you begin weighing good and bad effects in this way, side effects, effects that are caused to innocent people by the fact that there's a war on, distributional issues arise. We're looking at bad effects on some people as against good effects on others. Do they always cancel out? I don't think they do always cancel out. If my going to if if a particular act of war is going to kill innocent ten innocent people as a side effect, it's not obvious to me that that's completely canceled out by the fact that it would also save ten other innocent people as a side effect. That's partly because there are issues of fairness here. That is, can saving ten really cancel out killing ten others? But it's also because of the distinction or the difference between killing and letting die. We think that uh, you can't normally justify killing 10 people by saying, oh, but look, by killing these 10, we're going to save these other 10, even if the killing is unintended in this way. So there are issues about fairness in the distribution of the effects of war. When we're thinking about weighing up the good and bad effects of war on innocent people. There are really serious questions about whether equivalent goods do really morally cancel out equivalent bad effects. There's also a further issue about the way in which the effects are caused. This is something that I think people aren't really well aware of, but our intuitions will tell us that how bad effects come about as a result of what we do makes a difference to the weight that they may have in proportionality calculations. So let me give you an example of that. Suppose if I uh, um, do this one act of war and it's going to kill 10 enemy combatants, but as a side effect it's going to kill 10 innocent civilians. And I ask, is that proportionate? 10 
deaths of enemy combatants, 10 side effect deaths of innocent people. I think most people would say, no, that's disproportionate. <laughs> but now consider another example. Suppose that the 10 enemy combatants I'm going to kill are people who have a dual role. You know, a couple of days a week, they, they are combatants. They actually go out and fight and fire weapons and that kind of thing. A few other days of the week, they act as medics. And in particular, they act as surgeons. And a lot of the surgery they do isn't just on their own forces, but it's on members of the civilian population. So suppose that these are these 10 enemy combatants, all of whom are surgeons, suppose that tomorrow they're all scheduled to perform life-saving surgeries on innocent civilians, and that if they're killed, nobody else can perform those surgeries. And I know this. So I know that if I kill these 10 enemy combatants, that's going to result in the deaths of the 10 innocent civilians whose lives would have been saved by these combatants in their role tomorrow as surgeons. Ought I not to kill them now? Most people think that's irrelevant. It's irrelevant that tomorrow they would have saved the lives of 10 people. That's not an effect that we're supposed to take account of in our proportionality calculation. And notice that that is actually the way people think about individual self-defense and punishment as well. When we punish people, we don't give any weight usually to the effects of the punishment on these people's relatives and so on, though those effects can be really terrible. But we don't, we don't count that in uh, among the, 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 effects of, uh, the, the, the effects that we are required to take into account in deciding whether or not it's permissible to punish somebody. Let me make now a, a, a really controversial claim, and I'll just say a, a tiny bit about this. As you notice, this, this talk is really kind of scattershot. I'm just going from one issue about proportionality to another, trying to show you the complexity of what's at issue here. Here I want to make a point. This is a kind of substantive point that is intended to show that all this kind of theorizing about proportionality does have real uh, implications for real life cases, some quite radical. In the history of the theory of the just war and in the law of war, it is assumed that all combatants in a war can uh, satisfy the proportionality constraint governing the conduct of war. It's assumed that even if you're fighting in an unjust war, there's something that can be considered disproportionate conduct of the war by you or proportionate conduct of the war by you. It's assumed that a satisfaction of the proportionality requirement in war is equally possible and equally easy, really, whether the person who's supposed to be restricted by it is fighting in a just war or fighting in an unjust war. Now, I don't think that makes any sense. It doesn't make any sense with respect to the resort to war. Suppose I'm proposing that we go to war where there's no just cause, where our aim in the war is unjust. Suppose I'm Hitler and I'm, I'm saying to you, let's go invade Poland and Czechoslovakia and Belgium and Denmark and France and Russia, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and somebody asked me, well, would that be proportionate? That is, would the, would the harms that we might be causing as a side effect to innocent people be outweighed by the goods that we would achieve in going to war? Well, there are no goods that we would be achieving in going to war without a just cause. All we would be achieving would be unjust aims. So it doesn't make any sense to ask of a war that's unjust, is it proportionate in the harms that it causes to innocent people? It's a question just that seems to me cannot arise. But everybody assumes that that question arises with respect to individual acts of war, even in an unjust war. So what are they thinking? What are the goods? What are the good effects that are being weighed against the bad effects of killing innocent people as a side effect, killing, let's say, innocent civilians as a side effect of the pursuit of the unjust goals of the war? How can you make that calculation? Well, I don't think you can. Uh, I think it's just nonsense. What that means is, on my view, the traditional theory of the just war says an individual act of war cannot be permissible unless it's proportionate. 
inference. It can't be proportionate, therefore it can't be permissible, therefore it can't be permissible to fight in an unjust war. Now that's contrary to what just war theory says and it's contrary to what the law of war says. Interesting to look at what the law of war says here. If you look at the Geneva Convention Protocol 1, what it says is that the harm to innocent civilians that's caused unintentionally mustn't be excessive in relation to the concrete military advantage to be gained. So we're weighing killing innocent people against something called military advantage. But how do you do that? You can't do that without attributing some kind of value to military advantage. We're weighing values here. I can't say, for example, let's weigh the deaths to innocent civilians against the color green. So how can I weigh it against something called military advantage, where what military advantage may mean is victory for the Nazis or victory for Saddam Hussein? Well, that's what they say. And I'll leave it to you to see if you think that you can uh, make sense of that. I do think that, there, there, that some acts of war by people who are fighting in an unjust war can be proportionate. I don't want to say that they all have to be disproportionate or that it doesn't make any sense to raise the question of proportionality with regard to acts of war done by people who are fighting in an unjust war. It seems to me pretty clear that people who are fighting in a just war can pursue their justified goals by impermissible means. And it can be morally permissible to stop people who are trying to do good by impermissible means by using force against them. And that force can be proportionate. So sometimes people who are fighting in an unjust war can actually, uh, their, their action can be considered proportionate. But there's no unjust war that could consist entirely of acts that were proportionate in this way. That's not a possibility. And in fact, it's not a realistic possibility to suppose that there could be an unjust war in which more than just a tiny fraction of the acts of war done by the people fighting in it were proportionate. Okay, that was a substantive thesis. Now back to another fiddly little um, philosophy question. Another issue about how we are to understand proportionality. I'm going to put this to you kind of in the, in the form of a, of a puzzle. And again, as far as I know, uh, nobody has ever given this any serious thought apart from a friend of mine in Toronto and one of his PhD students. Proportionality is comparative, just like the requirement of necessity is comparative. These are two general restrictions, both on war and on an act of war proportionality and necessity. I think it, you know, these are pretty uncontroversial uh, requirements. Everybody has to accept some version of both of these. But they're both comparative. So if we're thinking about going to war, the necessity requirement requires you to compare going to war with other alternative means that don't involve going to war of achieving your just cause. You're asking, is war necessary for the achievement of this aim? If there's some way you could achieve it without going to war, it's, the war would be unnecessary. Proportionality requires a different comparison. It doesn't require comparison with other alternatives. It requires comparison, <clears throat> say, in the case of a war, it requires comparing going to war, the effects of going to war, with the effects of not going to war. And an individual act of war is proportionate based on, or disproportionate, based on a comparison between doing that particular act of war and not doing that particular act of war. You don't compare it with you know, other alternative means of achieving the same aim. But the problem with this is that the comparison that we're doing here is what philosophers call a counterfactual comparison. We're having to ask what would have happened if we hadn't done this. So let's think about a particular act of war. I'm debating about whether to do this particular act of war, fire this missile, whatever it is. And I say, if I do it, these will be the effects. To figure out whether it's proportionate, I have to ask, I have to compare those consequences with what would have happened 
if I didn't do it, or what would happen if I don't do this particular act of war. That's the relevant comparison. Now the problem here is this. If I don't do this particular act of war, I've got to do something else if it's only just sit still with my hands behind my back. But very likely I'm not going to just sit still with my hands behind my back. I'm going to do something else. Which of those something else's that I might do is the relevant one for the sake of comparison if I'm looking forward? If I'm looking forward and I'm saying, should I do this act of war or should I not? How do I figure out what's the alternative thing I might do against which I should compare it? Well, you might say, well, you compare it with the best thing that you might otherwise have done. Well, that won't work because that just makes proportionality a kind of maximizing standard. It means that any time you do less than the very best thing you could ever do, it's disproportionate. And that's clearly not what we mean by dis uh, disproportionate. You could say, well, just compare it with what you would just in fact do, whatever it is, if you don't do this particular act of war, if you don't go to war. Well, suppose in the case I'm deliberating about going to war <coughs> because a just cause has arisen. And I think, okay, I'm going to go to war. And somebody asks, well, would you, is your going to war be proportionate? And I think, well, I have to ask myself, well, what would I otherwise have done if I, if I didn't go to war? Well, what if what I would otherwise have done was something really horrible? I was planning a nice genocide, and I decide, well, there's this just cause. I'll pursue the just cause rather than conducting the genocide. If that's the relevant comparison, then any war I go to is going to be proportionate. So proportionality can't depend on just what I would happen to have done, whatever it might have been. Then you might think, well, whatever you would have been most disposed to do among the permissible alternatives, what about that? Well, the problem with that is, why should proportionality depend on what I might have wanted to do otherwise? Even among permissible alternatives. There might be lots of permissible alternatives. What if the, my, the permissible alternative that I really would have done would have been doing some great charitable act? So if, 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 it's a, if, if it's a country, let's say, so I said, well, I, I could go to war, but if I don't go to war, I think what I would do is use all the resources that I would have spent on the war to cure malaria in Africa. Well, then any war is going to look disproportionate. There's another problem here, a logical problem. About, it's a problem of uh, regress. That is, uh, if I have to compare uh, proportionality with permissible alternatives, then I've got to determine that the alternatives are permissible. And if I'm going to determine that they're permissible, I've got to determine that they're proportionate. But I haven't figured out how to do proportionality yet. So how can I determine what the permissible alternatives are? Anyway, that's a mess. Um, and I'm running out of time. And I'm not very far into this. You got an extra couple hours? That you <laughs> no, I've got to, I've got to stop in, in five minutes. What should I tell you? Um, <clears throat> let, me, let me open up a really controversial issue here, and I'll end on that. Uh, the controversial issue here arises from the fact that I think that proportionality is sensitive not only to the issue of whether the people against whom force is directed are liable or not, and by not liable I mean innocent, whether the people are morally liable to be harmed whether they're innocent and not liable to be harmed. Proportionality is sensitive to that distinction, um, as I mentioned when I distinguish between narrow proportionality and wide proportionality. That's the essence of that distinction. But it seems to me in common sense thinking and in my thinking, proportionality judgments are also sensitive, surprisingly, to the intentions with which an agent acts. So if we're thinking about harms to innocent people in war, we're going to have one standard for harming them intentionally and another standard for harming them foreseeably but unintentionally. Normally we, what we say is if we're harming innocent people in war intentionally, that's terrorism. That's what it, if you're harming innocent people intentionally in war, you're usually doing that in order to intimidate and coerce other people. 
because if you're harming innocent people, if they're innocent, you're not achieving anything direct in the way of defense or whatever by killing them or harming them because they're not threatening you. Or they're not wrongfully threatening you anyway. But sometimes, I think most all of us who are not absolutists recognize that it can be permissible in extreme conditions intentionally to harm innocent people, even intentionally to kill innocent people. Uh, we have provisions for that in domestic criminal law. We have a, d a justification of necessity or a defense of necessity in criminal law. You can sometimes intentionally kill an innocent person and not be convicted of murder if you have a plausible plea of necessity. So we believe that. But in war, we think that the proportionality restriction on harming innocent people unintentionally, though foreseeably, we know we're doing it, but it's not our goal, we have a weaker proportionality restriction there. So we have, usually in self-defense and war, we have really three hierarchically ordered important proportionality restrictions. The first one is the narrow one. It's proportionality in what you are intentionally doing to the people who are liable to be harmed, who are, generally speaking, your attackers. That's one proportionality notion. It's, in, it's inherent in the very notion of liability. There's a notion of how much someone is, how much harm a person may be liable to suffer. That's the narrow proportionality notion. Then there are two kind of wide proportionality notions here. What we, there's proportionality in what we do intentionally to innocent people. And that's a very stringent proportionality requirement there. It takes, you have to prevent a vastly greater harm to other innocent people in order to justify intentionally harming some innocent people. That, I think, is right. But we have a weaker standard with respect to the unintended harming of innocent people. This is what goes under the ugly label collateral damage in popular discussions of war and the morality of war. Um, now, what I think is interesting here is that Sometimes people that we think of as in the protected category, namely civilians or non-combatants, can act in ways that make them liable not really to intentional attack, but to side effect harms that occur as a result of our military action directed against military targets. So now I'm going to give you an example. This is what's controversial. Uh, I should preface this by saying I, I, I talked with Steve's class a little earlier today, and I, I got very heated about this. Uh, and, and everybody gets heated when you talk about Israel and Palestinians. And I'm going to talk for just one minute about Gaza here. But let me preface this by saying that I am anti-Israel and I'm anti-Palestinian. So I'm anti-everybody. So uh, you know, I'm, I'm not discriminatory here. I think they're all doing wrong. All of them. Um, so if this, if this sounds kind of uh, pro-Israeli or something like that, don't, don't have that delusion, though. You know, I, as, as regards means, I think Israel does better than the Palestinians. As regards ends, I think the Palestinians' ends are more just than Israel's ends. Uh, I have lots of friends over there. I discuss this stuff a lot. I don't mean to be provocative here. I'm just trying to illustrate this point. So let's take the case of a Gazan civilian of whom all of the following assumptions are true. Okay, So I'm just stipulating this. This is by hypothesis. Suppose there is a civilian in Gaza of whom all these things are true. He voted for Hamas, knowing that Hamas is pledged to a policy of terrorism, as a policy of intentionally shooting rockets into Israel trying to kill Israeli civilians. It's also true of this hypothetical Gazan civilian that he's well aware that weapons are being brought into Gaza through tunnels and so on, weapons that are intended for use against Israeli civilians. He knows that these weapons are being stored in the cellars and basements of apartment houses and schools and hospitals. He knows that these missiles are going to be fired from residential streets and residential areas into Israel and that there's going to be almost automatic retaliation by Israel against the launch sites of these weapons. 
And he doesn't do anything to protest this at all. He thinks this is fine. This is the way, this is the only way you can deal with these Israelis. We've got to put up a resistance. We've got to defend ourselves, whatever they tell themselves. Suppose it's true. All of these things are true of this Gazan. And then he happens to be nearby one of the launch sites when Hamas launches a weapon. Israeli retaliatory strike comes back, blows up the weapons launcher, and he's injured as a side effect. Does he have any legitimate complaint? Has he been wronged by Israel given his complicity in the act that provoked the retaliatory strike by which he was harmed as an unintended effect? My view is that he doesn't have much of a complaint. If he doesn't have a complaint, if he's not wronged by what's been done to him, that's another way of saying he was liable to suffer that harm. Now, he may not have been liable to suffer that harm as an intended effect, because he may not have been liable. There's no purpose in attacking him intentionally, but if he gets harmed incidentally as a side effect of a retaliatory strike aimed at a military target, uh, it's not obvious to me that that harm counts in the proportionality requirement, at least not in the wide proportionality calculation concerned with effects on innocent people, because in the relevant sense here, with respect to the unintended harm, this individual isn't innocent, even though he's a civilian. Okay, I already see some people getting upset, so I'll go straight to discussion. There, by the way, you, you, you missed a couple more boring pages of stuff here, but okay. I think somebody here is really eager to go. Is it okay? You may, you may normally do the five-minute break, but is it okay? One of the things that we have to remember in terms of like <coughs> that proportionality within that conflict is that the status of the combatant versus the non-combatant in either of those territories, because in Israel, <coughs> all civilians have to serve in the army. And that, I think, changes a bit um, the, the, just the status of the civilian or the Israeli civilian, civilian since everyone has to give like, time to the military. And in Palestine, conversely, <coughs> there is no military to become a combatant within because it's not a legitimate state. So can you discuss a little bit about that? Um, I can say a, a, a lot more about that than you ever want to hear. Um, but I'll try to say a, a little bit of, of all of that. Um, two things, first of all. Morally, I think, the distinction between combatant and non-combatant is completely irrelevant. It's a nice legal distinction. It's a nice legal category. But it's precisely in context in which some people who are technically non-combatants engage in terrorist activity and so on that this kind of distinction breaks down. It's all, there are lots of other ways, too. It just seems to me that a, what group a person belongs to, the group of civilians or the group of combatants or whatever, can't be determinative of that individual's moral status. This is a kind of form of collectivizing of moral status, and that's always unjust. It's what people are doing that determines whether they are liable to attack or are not liable to, to certain harms. It's what they, as individuals, are doing. It's a function, liability is a function of individual action, not of identity. So combatant, non-combatant distinction, I think, is, it has no uh, non-conventional moral con content. Um, secondly, we go through life and have certain roles at different phases of our lives. And it may be true of an Israeli kindergartner that she eventually will do some service in the IDF, maybe a year or two. Uh, and it may well be that at that, you know, we can plausibly predict that by the time she gets to inducted and in, conscripted into the IDF, Israel will still be unjustly occupying the West Bank. That can't make her liable to attack as a kindergartner now. Though I have actually heard both Israelis and Palestinians say that of their opposite numbers. I've, I've heard Israelis say, well, they're all, this was back a while ago, they're all future PLO. And I've heard Palestinians say, but they're all future IDF. 
Um, <clears throat> liability to harm is restricted to uh, circumstances in which a person is at that time responsible for a wrong that can be prevented or corrected by means of uh, 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 by means of harming that person where that person is responsible for the wrong. That's the relevant notion. So that somebody will later be a member of the IDF is really irrelevant to their status now, I think. Just, you know, by the way, uh, as long as I'm outraging everybody here, I will also say that where uh, liability is concerned, I, I am strongly inclined to believe that civilian settlers in the West Bank, those who voluntarily go there for their own purposes, are liable to various kinds of harm, possibly even intentional attack. I don't think that's true of their children or anything like that, but people who go there as part of, a, as part of an active policy of territorial aggrandizement, they are, they are taking part, they are active in the process of committing a, 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 a kind of wrong that most people think constitutes a just cause for war, namely theft of national territory, people who are actively involved, boots on the ground, as it were, in that, even if they are not themselves carrying weapons, which most of the settlers do anyway, they can be liable. That's, that's a form of wrongdoing that can make somebody liable. So um, I said this thing about how Palestinian civilians may make themselves liable to some harms, and I think this, uh, comparable things are true of some Israelis as well. But as I say, I think they're all they're all acting pretty badly over there. And then you could solve that problem by people, by people on both sides being a bit nicer. Um, I have a question about your earlier thesis. You, you said that individual acts of war must be, I guess, just and proportional in order for them to be moral. And you said that if you have an unjust cause of war, and then individual, individual acts of war will therefore be unjust. I have, I have some trouble seeing how that, the unjustness of the cause of war would transfer to, I guess, an individual act, just because if an individual is involved in a war, he is a combatant and therefore he is liable to harm. So he, doesn't he have the right to self-defense that will, would allow him to fight from in just manners? Morally, no. I think people who are, uh, who are fighting in a just war, that is, somebody who is defending himself and other innocent people against a wrongful attack, wrongful aggression, and is simply defending himself against the attackers and defending other innocent people against the attackers, doesn't do anything to lose his right not to be attacked. If you attack him, you're attacking somebody who has a right not to be attacked and a right not to be killed. You're violating somebody's rights. He has a right of self-defense against you, but why would you have a right of self-defense against him? Um, you know, if you're killing innocent people and I'm the police and I come along and I try to stop you and I have to use force, do you have a right of self-defense against me? I'm saying like if, if I am a soldier from a state that has gone to war unjustly, I still have a right to self-defense individually. Well, that's what I'm challenging. I don't see how, how that can be true. I just, I mean, that's what, that's, that's, that's what people in the just war tradition say. And that's what the law of war says. So legally, yes, legally you have a right of self-defense. But I'm asking a deeper moral question. Morally, if you're where you ought not to be, killing people in their homeland for unjust aims because some guy told you to go do that because you're a member of the army, does that then give you the right to defend yourself against people who are just defending themselves against you when you're trying to wrong them, when the effect of your action is to deprive them of their freedom or whatever it is you're trying to deprive them of? Why would you have the right of self-defense in, in that circumstance? I mean, that's what everybody believes, but I'm trying to challenge people to think about that. Yeah? Uh, I have a question about your concept of there not being such a thing as proportionality in individual actions and unjust war. And I found your, your theoretical argument very convincing, but I'm wondering, I have a concern about the practical implications of that, which it seems like Currently, if you commit an uh, unproportional act, if it's an unjust war, you're still guilty of widely defined war crimes. You're liable in some sense for your unproportional action. 
What worries me is that we make any kind of participation in an unjust war um, non-proportional. It kind of suddenly suggests that all of these people <coughs> have committed a war crime, in some sense. and therefore, why why stop there? Why not just have everyone? You know, what's to prevent them from going farther than they would with, you know, the concept of proportionality in this war? It seems like it might be kind of, you know, a noble lie in that sense. That maybe it doesn't make theoretical sense, but it might make these wars less violent than they okay, could be. Okay, good. Well, I, you've already given the right answer to your question. <laughs> um, I mean, you've raised a really good question, and I think you've given the right answer to it. Namely, um, when people are going to do wrong, whatever we do, it would be nice if we could get them to exercise some restraint in doing wrong. Um, you know, if people are going to burgle houses, um, we, might, we might find it convenient to say something like this in the end. Um, If you're going to, you know, if you're going to burgle houses, well, it's, you know, it's okay if you take only a little bit, but, but it would really be excessive if you killed all the inhabitants and burned the house down when you left. And if the only way we could get them not to do that was to tell them that it was okay to take the china, then probably we should tell them that it's permissible to take the china or say so. It's proportionate to take the china. Uh, something like that. So I, I, I agree. In practical terms and in the law, we need ways of getting people to accept restraints. And the best way to do that now is to impose the same restraints on the just and the unjust, partly because everybody believes that they're doing right. And so if you say, to, if, you say if you're doing right, here's, here, you know, it's permissible to do this, but if you're being naughty, you just can't do anything at all, well, everybody's going to think, well, I'm doing right. So they're going to hold themselves accountable if, to any rules. They're going to hold themselves accountable to the rules that apply to the people who, are, who have the just cause. So the law of war and the pragmatics here requires us to try to present to people a kind of compromise. We want to present a set of rules that will uh, allow the good guys to do as much as they need to do, you know, as much as we can to enable them to achieve their just cause, but that will also constrain the bad guys. So we, we, we impose unfair constraints on the good guys. We tie one hand behind their back in some ways, legally, um, in order to be able to tie the same hand of the bad guys behind their back. Yes? In speaking of war, there's a chain of command. And what I, I hope you could talk a little bit about is the, or is there, a relative uh, degree of responsibility depending on the importance of the person <coughs> in the chain of command. This is much in the news, <coughs> in the newspapers now, we speak of torture. Uh, and in war, you would speak of other acts which are not directly torture, but require perhaps killing people. Um, and you have an individual who is way down on the chain of command, faced with life and death decisions about his behavior, vice, a person, a group, a house. Um, is he covered? by the orders given? Um, I think in a better world, he wouldn't be fully covered. My view is this. In the history of thinking about war, one dominant idea, you find it very explicitly in Augustine, you find it in Shakespeare, you find it everywhere. You find it in Hobbes. It's the idea that <clears throat> When you're under orders from legitimate authority, responsibility for what you do within the rules transfers right up the chain of command. And that releases you from responsibility even for wrongdoing. My view is that's A, not correct morally, and B, it's pernicious. Because it lets people think, 
I'm really not doing anything wrong. If I'm doing anything wrong, he's responsible. And the fact that he's responsible releases me to do it. That is, it becomes permissible because responsibility transfers to him. I just don't think that's a very plausible idea. I'm actually doing it. I'm a free agent. I have a choice. You decide what to do. Now, it may well be, being at the bottom of the chain of command, I'm constrained in various ways. I don't have a lot of relevant information. I'm under orders. I'm going to be court-martialed if I don't do it, and all this other stuff. So what I'm describing here is that people at the bottom of the chain of command have a lot of excusing conditions that apply to what they do. So if we were thinking about punishing them for what they do, it would be a bad idea because they can say they have these excuses, and these are recognized in law. That is, I was under orders, they would have hurt me if I hadn't done it, I didn't really understand this, there's no way I could get the information, and so on. And those excuses tend to apply less and less the higher up you go in the chain of command. Higher up you go in the chain of command, the, the, the um, less severe the consequences of disobedience might be, and certainly the, there's an expectation that people will have greater knowledge and understanding of what, what they're doing the higher up they are. There is also this instrumental uh, claim that I think is, is very important. And that is, there, there are various ways in which the efficiency of the military can be compromised when the chain of command is disrupted. Uh, but there are different ways in which the chain of command can be disrupted. People worry a lot about the kind of views that I have about the morality of war because I'm encouraging people to low down sometimes to disobey orders because what they're asked to do is wrong. People say, well, that's going to upset the chain of command. There's a lot to say about that. Another thing that upsets the chain of command is um, holding people at the bottom responsible and not holding people at the top responsible. And one of the things that I have seen... Uh, a number of politically very conservative military officers go ap apoplectic about is the uh, failure of responsibility to transmit up the chain of command in the Bush years so that you know, people at the bottom can no longer feel that they are protected if they obey orders. They are going to think, if I don't do what I'm if I, if I do what I'm told, I'm going to go to jail. I'm sorry, but I don't understand the military law and, and international humanitarian law. It is illegal to carry out an illegal order, and you're supposed to know the relevant law, and you can disobey an illegal order. That's it, been, it's come up in, yeah, in, you're the required. Also in the most recent international criminal tribunals, and it's also been within court martial proceedings. So you actually are, are legally protected if you disobey an illegal order. So we don't offer on the ground, especially with regard to disproportionate acts or killing civilians or torture? Uh, my, my point was that uh, we, exempt, we exempt people at the top, and that's what undermines the chain of command. Um, it is true that now uh, individual combatants are not just permitted, but actually required to disobey what's known as a manifestly unlawful command. Now, <clears throat> when, when people were told, soften them up a bit for us at Abu Ghraib, was that a manifestly unlawful command? Well, they knew that it was coming from higher up, and it did. And we know now that it came all the way from Rumsfeld and Cheney, very explicitly all the way down. We know a lot about what they were, what they were doing. Have they faced any penalties? No. And that's what really upset the, the, the officers I'm thinking about here. They were really upset because the Bush administration had undermined, in their view, the military chain of command. You know, the original thing was that superior orders can be claimed as an excuse, and it's actually not true. I agree that we need to go further up the chain of command for illegal orders. Morally, I was, I was referring to morally. And if you're, if you're facing various forms of sanction, even if they're not legal, because how much of this stuff really does come to military tribunals or courts. Not much of it. So a lot of this is dealt with informally. And if, if, you, if, you, if you're in Abu Ghraib and you say, no, I'm not going to do this and I'm going to turn you in or whatever, or I'm going to squeal, I'm going to blow the whistle on all of this, um, you're going to be in trouble. <coughs> so I'm talking about an informal 
kinds of pressure and duress, not necessarily legal sanctions. So when people at the bottom of the chain of command are obeying orders, even if they're unlawful or illegal orders, they are usually doing this under tremendous pressure. And I'm saying that's that's an excusing condition. Can I ask one more question? Sure. When, when do we intentionally harm civilians using the proportionality rule? You said that earlier. Um, I know we do harm civilians. We usually say that it's an unintentional harm because of some other good. But you said that we intentionally often harm civilians Not as often, part but of proportional. Uh, I, was, I, was I was simply calling attention to a category of justification that most of us accept. So if in order to prevent some great catastrophe from occurring, vast number of innocent people from being harmed, I've got to intentionally harm some innocent people. Morally, I can claim uh, a, a lesser evil justification. In law, I could claim a justification of necessity. Um, and I'm saying that there's, there's, a, there's a weighing of claims here, the harm caused to the innocent people and the harm prevented to other innocent people, and that's a proportionality judgment. But the proportionality judgment is different if the harm that we would cause would, we would, be, would be caused intentionally as a means of preventing the other harms, whereas the proportionality constraint is less restrictive if the harm we would cause would be unintended. It would be a side effect of our action rather than intended as a means. That was the, that's the only point I was making. And I'm going to be hard pressed to give you examples of necessity, but I think you'd probably find people in the United States who would want to claim that the uh, intentional killing of uh, tens of thousands of innocent civilians in Hiroshima and Nagasaki was justified as an instance of necessity. That's the, that's the claim that's usually made. Um, there's no doubt about it that the United States dropped nuclear bombs on cities full of uh, civilians. That's what we usually call terrorism uh, because the whole aim of that was to put pressure on the government to do what we wanted it to do, which it ought to have done without our having to do that. But you know, that was the aim, to influence the decisions of the government by killing these innocent people. So um, that, but, but that case is conceived of as it's illegal in international humanitarian law, and it's also immoral. So it's not a thing where we would justify a proportionate event by intentionally harming. Intentionally harming civilians is both illegal and immoral. Well, no, no, what I'm, so what, look, what I'm no saying... No, look, forget about law. Forget about law. I'm talking about morality here, okay? Yeah, no one uses that as a moral act. Sure they do. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I've, uh, it's, Hiroshima? Yes. And the moral have, you never, have you never found anybody who thought that the bombing of Hiroshima was morally permissible? Because I think the bulk of Americans believe it was. I think if you walk outside of this room and, you know, if people know anything about World War II and you ask them, was the United States guilty of wrongful terrorism at the end of World War II by bombing Hiroshima and Nagasaki, they'll say no. They'll say no, that wasn't wrong because we were fighting a just war against the bad guys and the only way we could get them to surrender without conducting a land invasion of the Japanese islands was to drop those bombs. Now, the factual claim there is false, but they don't realize that, okay? So, but the form of argument that they make is a lesser evil form of argument. It's a justification of necessity where they're admitting, yes, we, we were killing innocent people, but we were saving so many more innocent people that it was justified. And they were also saying a lot of, you know, if we had had a ground invasion, a lot of Japanese civilians would have been killed then too. So it's, it was a wash where Japanese civilians were concerned. That's, that's the kind of argument you would get. So I'm just giving you that as a kind, as an example of this form of argument, the, the proportionality in the intentional infliction of harm on innocent people. Well, the, way, the argument comes out the wrong uh, way to test, but not your argument. That's right. I have a little follow-up. Okay.
not totally compelling. But I do have this. Well, quote. can I just say one thing? Historians have made a lot of progress in their understanding of what was actually happening at that time. So the things that people said in the immediate aftermath of the war, many of them turn out actually not to have been true, as matters of fact. A question about the recruit in the United States, man or woman, or the young man or woman who is potentially a recruit and is about to sign up in but potentially, let us say, to fight a just war. Mm -hmm. A war, which this person has no idea will be just or unjust, in whose terms we're not going back to the medieval philosophers here. We're you could do worse. We're in some kind of war. Pardon? You could do worse than to go back to the medieval philosophers. Well, I know we could, and I'm sure you do. Uh, and many people in this room have. But this young recruit talking to the recruiter in the high school gymnasium has a clue. It doesn't think in these terms. He's signing up to do potentially massive damage to other people, or he kills himself. Mm -hmm more justified if the war is just, less justified if the war isn't, then who in heaven's name, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> we'll forgive that one, Max. Go ahead. Who on earth will designate this war just and that unjust? Mr. Cheney? No, I'm, 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 I'm happy to volunteer. Um, <laughs> I, I actually am of, the, of the, the school of thought that uh, says that there really, in most cases, there really isn't a correct answer to that question. It takes a lot of hard work to figure it out. But it's not as if there's no answer to it. It's not as if we, can, we should just shake our heads and say, well, who was right, the Nazis or the Brits? I don't know, it's a toss-up. Or there's just, you know, we, we can't figure these things out. So that, that's unfair, really, in a way, to say take the clear cases. But even as we get farther from the clear cases, there's a, you know, if you think about it carefully enough, I think there's an answer to be got there. Now, do I expect the high school guy at the recruiting office to get that answer just with a, you know, with a, with a, with a, with a good guess? No. So it seems to me that we do that person a grave injustice when we send him off to war without providing him at all with proper guidance or with the resources to think about these things. We take these young people and we ask them, would you please, for, for, for a good paycheck, go off and kill these people for us? We ask them to go out and do something that all of us are profoundly reluctant to do, and is go out and kill people. Uh, and they have to break down that reluctance. We ask them to do this, and we pay them to do it, and we get them when they're young and, and susceptible, which is also when they're vigorous and strong. It's kind of unfortunate. But that's, that's the way it is, fact of human life, that when people are best at doing the physical stuff that's necessary for fighting wars, they're not mentally and emotionally matured enough to, to as, as much as they will be later, to assess and evaluate what it is they're being asked to do. They're much more willing to go off and do stuff like this and take people's word for it that they're doing right. But we're doing them a great disservice by asking this of them without providing them requisite guidance or resources for thinking about these things for themselves. But we, we allow the same kind of um, treatment of, our, of ourselves uh, when we don't demand of our leaders that they uh, submit decisions about war to kind of procedural constraints that have make that have some guarantee that moral considerations will be taken into, con 
into account. And we don't require them to produce decent moral justifications when they propose to go to war. Um, so what I'm trying to do in the things that I'm writing about war now is to change the way that we as a people, our culture, thinks about war. I'd like not just ours, but all people. It's not something that you should do just when some clown in a high office says to you, would you go kill these people? Or not, they don't say, they don't put it in, the, they don't put it as question, they say, go kill these people now. And we all happily trot off and go do it. And that's the wrong way to proceed when people tell you to go kill people. We, and we need to, we need to, the, the, the resources of kind of moral philosophy are, aren't going to be accessible to everybody. You know, nobody, not everybody can spend as much of their time thinking about just war theory as I do. Um, so so we, we, ha we, have to ha we have to create institutions that perform that function in our society. We don't have those. Have you written about the uh, morality issues of the conscientious objective? A little bit, not a whole lot. Um, okay. Where do you come out? Uh, I think that there has to be uh, some kind of legal provision for selective conscientious objection based on uh, moral arguments and not just religious arguments. Um, and I think that these provisions should be available for active duty military personnel as well. And uh, I don't think that that will subvert the military or prevent countries from fighting just wars. And in fact, uh, you, you mentioned this, I, 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 I gave a, a lecture uh, last night at West Point on the way up here, and at dinner before the talk, I was with a, a bunch of the officers who teach in the philosophy program there, and a couple of them are actually in their own work thinking about conscientious objection by military personnel. So I had a really nice discussion with a, an active duty major in the army who's writing about this and arguing himself for uh, greater acceptance within the military of selective conscientious objection by active duty military personnel. It's not, it's, and there's, no, there's a civilian professor in the philosophy program at West Point who's writing about this too. So these ideas aren't confined just to kind of long-haired philosophers like me. Th these things are under active discussion at places like West Point. Now, I don't think that they're under active discussion much in the Pentagon. But in, so, in some areas of the military world, people are thinking about these things, and very seriously and earnestly. Um, yeah, sure. So, I mean, war has been going on for human history, and, and I agree with you that you know, we have to start thinking in uh, thinking ways you're thinking. But it's such a part of human nature. So are you just thinking of, of the rules of war? Well, I'm thinking of changing the way we think about it, but also changing the rules ultimately and changing the institutions. I think in a lot of cases, before you can change the rules, you've got to change the institutions. Um, <clears throat> right now, I think we have to tolerate an enormous divergence between what's really true morally about war and the, the legal rules that we are going to have that regulate the conduct of war. We're going to have to permit things precisely for the reasons I was suggesting earlier, primarily because everybody believes they're fighting in a just war. And all governments say that they're fighting in a just war. And, in, and we don't have any kind of international institutions that can uh, authoritatively contradict a country's claim that it's fighting in a, in a just war in a way that Everybody agrees, yes, that's, that's the end of the story now. Um, so we have to have rules that are going to apply neutrally to everybody. And that's, that, I think, is a bad thing. Uh, we've got beyond that a long time ago in criminal law um, because we developed institutions that enabled us to discriminate between the good guys and the bad guys in criminal law. And so the aim of criminal law now is to protect people's rights. It's not just to put some restraints on people and minimize harms overall. But the goals of the law of war are just to restrain everybody a little bit and try to minimize the harm that's caused when we go to war. But I think we can do better than that eventually. What we should aim for is 
changing our institutions to enable ourselves to create, to, to, to revise and refine the law so that it comes more to discriminate between those who are fighting justly and those who are fighting unjustly and recognize those distinctions and say authoritatively to the people who are fighting in the unjust war, you are fighting in an unjust war. You better think about that. A lot of people care about whether they're acting rightly or wrongly, morally. And all of us tell ourselves that we're acting rightly. And it's very important to most people to believe that about themselves. Um, I, I found this out. I've also, uh, Steve, at the end of his little catalog of some of these recent papers that, that I published, cited one called Eating Animals the Nice Way. That's kind of sarcastic uh, <laughs> title. Um, uh, I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a vegetarian myself and have been for a very long time, but uh, there was a time when I was teaching at the University of Illinois and some other people were proposing to bring a couple of philosophers to the campus to discuss the, the animal issues, you know, issues about the ethics of our use of animals. Well, the University of Illinois had a big vet school and a big psychology department, and there were people in those departments who were very eminent in their fields who did animal experimentation, and they got uh, really frenzied about the idea that somebody would come and talk about animal rights at the University of Illinois, so they tried very hard to block the invitation to these philosophers to come speak there. And I was asked to intervene because I knew these people. I said, could you, just you, could you just kind of say that these people are reputable philosophers and they're not terrorists and they're not going to come blow up these people's labs and so on? And so I did. I said that. I said, yeah, these, these people are reputable philosophers. They just make arguments and you know, they're, 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 they're good and they're not going to blow up your... And I got involved in some exchanges with these scientists. Now, their, moral, their morality was being called into question because they were experimenting on these animals. And they thought they were doing something very good and important. They're curing diseases, finding out the nature of our minds and so on. They had this image of themselves as, as doing a lot of good. And here's somebody who was calling into question morally what they were doing. Well, that, you, and you'd be, you, you, you might or might not be surprised at how amazingly irrational people can become under that kind of pressure. People who are otherwise really smart people Will, will produce arguments that are just shockingly stupid. <laughs> when the, when the, and so you, you see that this, you know, that means a lot to people to feel that they're doing right. And that's true in war as well. So if you have somebody authoritatively saying, here are the arguments and here's why you're actually doing something that's moral, it's usually disturbing to people and they'll, they won't just brush it aside. So what I'm hopeful, what I, what I hope is that Eventually, after a long period of time, we will be able to revise our ways of thinking about war in ways that get people to ask these painful questions that the theories that we have now and the law that we have now exempts them from asking. Now, you know, the, the theory that we have now says, if you end up fighting in an unjust war, that's not your fault. It's not your responsibility. Don't worry about it. And legally, we say to people, you're not legally liable if your war turns out to be an illegal war. The, your leaders are responsible for the illegality or the legality of the war. Your job is just to obey the rules once you're there on the battlefield. That's all you have to do. And basically, all that means is don't kill civilians and don't torment your prisoners. And that's what we tell them. So it's not surprising that people go to war quite easily and happily and are ready to go kill people whenever their leaders want them to. And that's what I would like to change. I'd like to give people a sense that, I'd like for people to have the sense that they are actually more responsible for what they do than the current theories tell them that they are. It's not to say that I think they should be punished um, if, they, if they end up doing wrong, but it may be enough just to let them know that there really is an issue of personal responsibility.